Plant friends, welcome to the jungliest episode yet of Boomango Radio. Oh my goodness, plant friends, I am so freaking excited to bring this episode to you today. Such an epically planty conversation with some of the plantiest plantstagrammers around with some really epic collections. This episode, How to Manage a Large Plant Collection with Cyril Cybernated Soul Sister Plants and Welcome to the Jungle Home was largely inspired by you guys and your responses in the Bloom and Grow Radio 2020 listener survey that I have been combing through. So thank you for those of you who have already filled it out. It's linked in the show notes if you haven't yet. Please fill it out because I truly am reading all the responses and designing the next year of content based off of them, off of what you need. So what we learned in the listener survey answers is that many of us in the community are loving collecting plants. We're loving growing our plant collections. We're loving all the joy that keeping plants indoors are bringing us. But we are struggling a little bit when it comes to the overwhelm of learning how to manage this ever-growing collection we're all cultivating. So once I learned this, and I know personally that I've certainly struggled with this over my three years of plant parenthood and my fluctuating collection that's been as small as 30 plants and as large as 130 plants, so I decided to ask three plantstagrammers who I have admired for a while who have gorgeous collections to come on the show for this episode and pick their brains for their top tips for organizing, managing, and designing with their plant collections of 75 plus plants. And the rubric I use to pick these people is that they had to have more than 75 plants and they had to have a seemingly really good grasp on managing their plant collections and their plants look happy and healthy and so do they. And this conversation did not disappoint. And what's even more exciting is we've put together a little bonus for you. We are doing a giveaway on Instagram with cuttings from all of our personal collections, including a cutting of Raffi, my Raffidophora tetrasperma. So the giveaway is running on Instagram on my channel at Bloom and Grow Radio. So once you're done listening to this episode, head over to Instagram and make sure you enter so you can have a little bit of our collections in your home. And like I mentioned, if you haven't taken that listener survey, take two minutes right now and fill it out because it's so helpful for me in curating the content for the next year for Bloom and Grow YouTube and podcast. Special thanks to our newest Patreon Plant Friends supporters. You guys are the best. The Patreon Plant Friends are a group of listeners who support Bloom and Grow Radio monetarily on a monthly basis for as little as a fancy cup of coffee. So thank you to our newest supporters, Amanda Munoz, Francisca Rausch, and Sneaks. Thank you for making it possible for me to get this episode and portions of this episode on YouTube to as many planty ears and eyes as humanly possible so we can all keep blooming and keep growing. And if you're interested in supporting the show, you can click the link in the show notes to learn more. So back to this episode topic, I'm going to be honest with you, plant friends, I really wrestled with the idea for this episode and waited on my conscience a little bit because I want this episode to empower and support all of the people growing their plant collections right now, but also I in no way want this episode to make anyone feel pressured to increase their collections if it is not within their own alignment. I really want to stress this. The right number of plants is completely different for each person. So for some people, that's three plants. Four plants would be too much. Three plants is their sweet spot. And for others, like our fabulous guests, it's a lot, lot more. So after you listen to this episode, everybody's going to be inspired, but I want to encourage everyone to go for quality, not quantity, and stick with the amount of plants for your home that bring you joy and not stress. And I'll be sharing more of my thoughts on this and my personal collection and how its number has ebbed and flows at the end of this episode if you are interested. So listen to the end. That being said, for those of you with larger collections who I've created this episode for, man, I'm so excited for you to hear this jam-packed episode with amazing ideas. If you're curious to what these collections look like and what these episode guests look like because they're all super good looking, you can head over to my YouTube channel where I've put together a few snippets of the episode together and we have actually the video footage of the live interview on YouTube so you can click the link in the show notes to check them out. Okay, enough of my rambling. I'm so excited to introduce our Bloom and Grow community to Cyril from Cyril Cybernated, Lucretia from Soul Sister Plants, and Phoebe from Welcome to the Jungle Home. Let's get to it. A 
boy, plant friends. I'm so excited to welcome back one of our original Bloomingur Radio sponsors and my favorite planty accessory company, Modern Sprout. Modern Sprout is connecting people to plants with their fabulous lines of grow lights, hydroponic planters, and all sorts of planty accessories that empower people to cultivate their own indoor oasis, whether you're living in a tiny studio apartment or a sprawling farmhouse, with simple, stylish, and sustainable green thumb solutions for all of our homes. If you plant friends have been listening to the show for a while, you know that my love affair with Modern Sprouts started with their grow lights. I installed their grow bar into my bookshelf and turned my low light bookshelf into a high light plant haven. And I put their gorgeous grow house in my low light kitchen to help me grow herbs closer to my stove where I was cooking every day. So big news, Modern Sprout has recently updated their three styles of grow lights, the grow bar, which I have in my grow shelf, the grow frame, and the grow house, which I had in my kitchen, with their new smart technology. So all of their grow lights are smart lights now. So this new smart technology takes the ease of grow lights to the next level. So any Modern Sprout grow light you get now syncs with an app on your phone that has preset settings for either partial shade partial sun, or full sun, depending on what plants you're growing under them. They have an option to make a fully customizable schedule in case you want to run your plants under lights for a longer or shorter period of time than the presets. They have a dimming feature, and they all still have an on-off button in case you need to manually turn them on or off. If you're interested in seeing how the grow lights work, you can check out the demo I made on my YouTube channel. The link is in the show notes. And their other grow light product, which I love and totally have my eye on for our new home, is their grow frame which is a literal frame that has grow lights in it and is designed to be mounted on a wall. So plant friends, imagine putting a plant in a grow frame in a gallery wall or even on top of a headboard. And the options are limitless because the grow frame comes in three sizes and multiple colors. So check them all out. All of the grow lights Modern Sprout makes are full spectrum LED lights with that 4000K natural white light we all want for our plant babies. They're rated for 25,000 hours of usage, and they're eco-friendly and assembled in the United States. They also have an amazing line of planty accessories, my two favorites right now being the Wildflower Glow and Grow Candle, which is burning on my desk right now. When it's finished burning, the container actually turns into a planter for a plant, and my adorable mint green plant slippers that people are always asking me about on Instagram. Everything Modern Sprout makes from their grow lights to their accessories to their planters are super giftable and thoughtfully designed. So head over to ModernSprout.com and use the code 15BLOOM for 15% off at checkout. Once again, that's code 15BLOOM15BLOOM at ModernSprout.com for 15% off at checkout. Okay, back to the show. Welcome, my plant friends, to Bloom and Grow Radio. Hello. Hello. Hi, guys. I'm so excited. The first epic kind of group interview. So thank you so much for being my guinea pigs and one of my first guinea pigs for the video podcast component of it. So I couldn't think of three better people to welcome to the show to talk about epic plant collections. So before we dive into talking about your collections, I want our listener community to get to know each of you. I feel like I know you all because I stalk your Instagram accounts and have followed you for a while, but I'd love to know a little bit about your journey to becoming the plant parent that you are. And if you had a particular moment in your plant journey that you felt you became a real plant parent, a real collector kind of. Was there some sort of transformative moment? So, Lucretia, why don't we start with you? And also, you're otherwise known as, if you want to share your Instagram handle. Yes. So, my Instagram handle for all these plants is Soul Sister Plants. Mm -hmm. And that's Sista, Soul, S-O-S-I-S-T-A, plants. And let me see. When I knew that I was starting a collection was when I came home with about two or three plants and had no idea where I was going to put them. And so it was like, okay, what has to move so that I can accommodate these plants? Or what can I combine? Or what can I give away? That's when I knew that, okay, so this is really becoming way more serious than just going and picking up a couple of plants here and there. And I thoroughly enjoy it, picking up plants, even though I say, oh, no, not going to buy anything new because I just had a friend try to read me a few days ago when she was like, did you just say you bought another new plant? I'm like, listen, you go judge your mother, okay? (laughs) I needed 
that Swiss cheese plant because that's not even what I went for, but it looks so good. I just couldn't walk out the store without it. I think we can all relate to that. What's your calling? (laughs) Right. Okay. She didn't understand. It was calling to me from where it was hanging. That's not even what I went in there for. It wasn't your fault. It was the plant's fault. Blame it on the plant. Exactly. And that's why it's looking real gorgeous over there in the corner (laughs) looking at me right now. That's amazing. How long have you been collecting plants for? I want to say probably about a year and a half. I've had plants off and on, but to where it's the extent to where my collection is what it is now, probably about a good year and a half, really just going all in. And it all started with a single spider plant that is still over here thriving that has never pushed out a single baby, but it is lush and green and doing its thing. So I have enjoyed every minute of it and really learning which types and families of plants I really enjoy Mm. having and which ones just do not work for me. So that's been a great lesson. That's so important. Totally important. Oh, it is. Hugely. Yeah. I love it. Well, so excited to learn more about your collection in a little bit. What about Phoebe? You want to tell us a little bit about you and your plant parent journey? Yeah. So I always grew up with plants. I'm originally from Malaysia. So I've always been surrounded by greenery. I also watched my grandma always tending her plants, always gardening. So it was just very normal for me to just grow up having plants around me all the time. And like, even just like having a conversation of of, like with my grandma, with her about her plants and of her blooms. And it was just a really nice memory. And So when I moved to New York City, you know, it's a concrete jungle in New York. Your apartment's just bare, it's sad, and you're working hard to make the money in the city. And then you're like, um, why not just start brightening up your space, Phoebe? And I was like, yeah, let's do that. Plants obviously reminds me of home a lot. So that's how I just unintentionally just start collecting little plants here and there that reminded me of home. So like a snake plant, because my grandma actually, before I moved to the States, my grandma actually brought a snake plant to me and was like, you need to take this to New York. And I'm like, grandma, I can't bring a plant onto the plane and fly it. I get fine. I just can't bring plants like that. I need like a special certificate. Mm -hmm. She didn't get it. She was like, no, just smuggle it. Just do it. (laughs) She was like, I, I do it all the time. I'm like, it's not the same when you're like in a small little town going to a city in Malaysia. It's not the same. And she's like, no, you can totally do it. I'm like, no. And I told her, I promised I'll buy myself this plant because she was like, it's good for you. Like it's going to take out all the like electronic toxins because I work in the computer a lot. So yeah, I start collecting orchids. I started collecting like snake plants for myself that reminded me of grandma. And then as I grew my collection, I was like, oh, this could pair well with the orchids because of the colors. Oh, I like this textures. And slowly, I guess I just like one day, I think friends and family, they would come and they walk into my apartment. They're like, oh my God, it's like a jungle in here. And I think that was when Welcome to the Jungle Home kind of started because I don't know, I just kept hearing the word jungle. And people are like, oh my God, I have so many plants. I'm like, oh, maybe I am a little crazy. And also when your friends start going like, you have too many plants. That's when I was like, oh, maybe I do. Oh, well, like, I guess I'll start an Instagram and just see what happens. That's funny. Like Lucretia said, her friend is keeping her honest too. I feel like that is definitely a moment where you realize your normal daily friends don't Mm -hmm. necessarily share this like crazy connection to plants that you do. Yeah. And even like when your partner is like, honey, you need to stop. Like, I think Mm -hmm. you have too much. It's like having shoes. Like, you know how some people have shoes. It's like, oh, I don't think you should buy any more. It's like when they give you that intervention. Oh yeah. I got one (laughs) of those. I'm sure we all have. (laughs) Yeah, totally. I love that. Yeah. And I think that's why a lot of us take to the plant Instagram kind of online community. For me, definitely that was my experience of Oh, like my friends do not want to talk to me about my tomato plant blooming. Oh, totally. Like they don't want to talk about how nice my tomato plant smells with me. <laughs> they have no interest. And so it was nice <laughs> to then like go online and find people like you guys who were like, oh my God, tomato plant smells. That's my favorite smell or whatever. Or my orchid's blooming. Holy shit. Someone please care about this. It hasn't bloomed in a year, you know? <laughs> yeah. I love that. What about you, Cyril? Well, I've been collecting plants for almost three years now, three years in March next year. 
So I also just recently moved to California. I used to live and work in the Middle East in United Arab Emirates, to be exact. So back then, I was already aware of the plant Instagram, but it was more of the succulents and cacti. I would have them outside because they would naturally thrive in the desert. But when I moved here, just like Phoebe, I also come from the Philippines, Southeast Asia, and hey. represent. <laughs> Representing. <laughs> so uh, we grew up with a lot of tropical plants. And when I moved here, I guess the plant Instagram also started to change. And it opened my eyes to more types of plants. And I was thinking like, oh, this plant looks familiar. I'm kind of familiar with this plant. So I started hoarding those types of plants. And it was literally like a zero to a hundred in my case, I guess. Because I used to keep a plant journal of like, what was the name, common name, botanical name, where I bought oh it, God, how much it so was. Cute. And then I stopped at 150. Because I'm like, oh, ooh, I should stop doing this because it's just going <laughs> to get me more awareness. From then, when you see everything on social media, I mean, our parents or grandparents plant collecting back then was what you just see with your neighbor or your friends or whenever you visit relatives from other places. But because of social media, you are made aware of much more that's out there. And that's what makes you aware. And that's probably what made me want more of the plants that I didn't know or I was more familiar with. And I knew I could just bring them in. You know, so that what's kind of sparked the interest, I guess. When you say 150, I'm like, I feel like you have 150 cacti now. (laughs) You have an Um, unbelievable cacti collection. (laughs) Partly true, yes. He's so (laughs) humble about it too. I love that. He's like, partly true. Right. (laughs) We are also very lucky because you live in California, right? Yes, correct. So you can grow outdoors mm-hmm. where mm-hmm. Phoebe yes. and I are. That's not. Lucretia, where are you located? I'm in uh, Cincinnati, Ohio. Yeah. So the three of us, we don't get that nice outdoor four seasons. And another thing you said, Cyril, right. we've all had plants for more than a year. And I do feel mm-hmm. like another part of being a plant parent is having four seasons and then going mm-hmm. around in your second year of experiencing your second yes. fall, your second winter, mm-hmm. your second spring, especially seeing that second spring, like when your plants wake up again, I feel like that's really interesting too. that. Like my second year of plant parenthood definitely resonated. And it's also so lovely that you both feel connected to your home in that way by collecting plants. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like when I go home, I think, after starting to collect more plants and understanding what plants are out there, when I went home, I was like, oh my God, you're literally in the street, just out in the wild. Like people are paying so much money for it and you're just like oh. out there. And then you see my grandma. Isn't that crazy? See my grandma going like, oh, this looks cool. And she just like plucks it in the street. She's <laughs> like, I'll take care of it. And I'm like, oh my God, I think if you did this in the States, you get like, the police oh will come after you. A hundred percent. Lucretia, do you have any like familial connection to plants as well? Oh yeah. My grandmothers always had plants, always, and big, huge plants. And as a result, my parents always had large, huge plants. And this was nothing for me to do it. I just always thought I didn't have anywhere to put them. And But what I found was that I started buying things to put the plants on. And saying, oh yeah, plant would look really good right there. And (laughs) so all of my plants are in my living room area because this is the only window. So I have a south facing window that gets the majority of the light. So there are other spots in the house, but not like this. And I did not know at that time that south facing windows are some very coveted light if you've got that in a house. Mm So it's a some wonderful lighting. And this is where the majority of the plants sit. So when people see on Zoom calls or whatever, they'll see the plants that are behind me. But then I'm like, oh, you aren't even seeing the 30 (laughs) plants that are over here by the window or the 15, 16 snake plants that are over by the TV area. And they're like, you've got that many plants in that space. I'm like, judge your mother. Right. (laughs) Yes, I do. (laughs) <laughs> yes, I do. Yeah. And I can do whatever I want. I'm a grown up. Yes. And it's just fun seeing some of these plants that you would see when you were younger and understanding your parents' love of house plants and what it did for them. And then having that same type of reaction as I'm growing them or telling them about some new plant that I acquired or whatever. But when Phoebe was talking about the plants on the street that people will see and they're like, 
you paid how much for that bird of paradise? Those are weeds in our yard. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> I'm like, do you know how much people were pay for that weed in your yard? So that always cracks me up. Things that people are just like fighting over right now. Or with Christmas coming up, knowing that poinsettias grow in Florida, they're bushes for most people in their yards. Yeah. But you've got people who will buy them here in the Midwest and pay upwards of $50, $60 for a cutting of a poinsettia. And I'm like, wow. Oh, yeah, they're completely insane. They're beautiful when you see them. But I'm like, how much did you pay for that? <laughs> and it's going to die. <laughs> because it's not like you can replant it and it's going to come back. Totally, It's going to die. And it's also super toxic. I feel like a lot of people don't know how toxic yes. they are. Yeah. The pets or babies. How toxic a lot of plants are. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. Yeah. So many plants heavily toxic when they're cutting like, yeah, it's oozing some white stuff and I'm itching. <laughs> like, it's because it's toxic. So actually I have a really funny story about toxic plants. As I was slowly growing my collection, I saw a pencil cactus at Chelsea Garden in a local nursery. And I was like, oh, this is so cool. Like, what kind of plant looks like a stick? (laughs) Like, I want it. So I bought it home. I was very happy. I didn't have signal at the plant store. So I just, I was like, oh, it's cool. I'm going to buy it. Without thinking if it was toxic, it was just like, I want it. It's mine. And I went home. I was trying to also figure out what the plant was. So I was like, stick cactus, stick succulent. And it came out pencil cactus. But first thing that came out was highly toxic to pets and humans. And I was like, oh my God, I wasn't even worried about myself first. And then I started reading all these articles, how like someone accidentally, you know, was like cutting it or pruning it and like the sap hit into yeah. their eyes and they went blind. Oh, I'm like, oh my God. Oh, And then they're like, oh, and then like your pets would eat it and they'll die. And I was like, oh my God, like what did I just bring in? Luckily, three years later, it's still in my apartment. It's growing. It hasn't <laughs> harmed anyone. Knock on wood. Pixel does not care with my plans. I just trained him when he was really young. And I think he likes it. I honestly think he really likes it. So, yeah. I'm sure it's just his normal. <laughs> That's oh, yeah. He doesn't know a world in which an apartment doesn't look like that. Yeah. I mean, we adopted him in Miami. So I just want to say that he came from a tropical. <laughs> so you're helping him, really. You're helping him feel more at home. So exactly. you're just being a really good cat mom. So, okay. The next question I want to ask you guys is what is your number, your plant number? I feel like Cyril should go last. Yeah. (laughs) Cyril's going to be our big finale. Cyril's going to be our big finale. So I will start because I'm going to be the least exciting number. I moved. So my largest amount I think was 138 in my 500 square feet, but I recently moved and I gave a lot of plants away and I feel only have 64 plants right now. Okay, that's a good number. It's still a good number, but something that was interesting when I was counting today, I thought I would have about 40 plants. (laughs) And then I just, 41, 42, 43, Mm -hmm. 44, oh my God. And I was like, so it's really interesting, I think, because I have a lot of the same plants. So once you kind of get to know, I've got probably 10 snake plants, but I'm watering them like once a month. I know kind of how to do that. So that was interesting. So Lucretia, why don't I throw it to you next? I counted and I am up to around 75, 77 plants. Oh, great. Okay. So we're just like climbing up the rank. That's a good number. And no number is the right number for each person. We'll dive into that later in in our conversation, but you know. Okay. So Phoebe has never counted her plants before. So I started last year on my birthday. So I started my account January 16th and I only officially counted how many types of plants. So that I had a question about the counting. Okay. I counted how many types of plants instead of how many in total plants I have. Do you have both? No, I didn't do both because I I, I don't even want to know personally because <laughs> I think that would just scare me and <laughs> I'll just get really overwhelmed. But I counted how many types of plants. So if there's two types of snake plants that are different species, mm-hmm. but in the same family, mm-hmm. they're completely separate. But if I have two of the exact ones, I count it as one plant. Does okay. that make sense? Yes. So my number is 143. 143. I love okay. you. Okay. But that's 143 <laughs> asterisks, actually m- many more plants. <laughs> yeah. Depending on how you <laughs> want to. No doubt. Yeah. So oh, like, no doubt. Exactly. But majority of the collection, I try and I like to slowly grow the plants so like, they mature and they turn fuller. So I try not to group it too much. So if anything, I would give it like, it'll be like maybe a hundred and like 60. Okay. 
that's actually really impressive that you have 143 different types of plants. Now mm, that I'm letting mm, that sink no in. Doubt. Yeah. That's a lot of different types of plants with different care. Yeah. 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 But when I was talking to you, Maria, before this podcast, I told you I start counting. So every year on my birthday, I told myself I have to count my plants. It's like a thing I have to do. Mm -hmm. But this year I started, so I started counting in my bedroom. It was 42. And I was like, I need to stop. <laughs> it's like 42 in one room. It's, it's a lot of plants. It's a lot. It is. Yeah. But they make you happy. And also you care for them in a healthy way. So for you, that number makes sense. Yep. And I can't wait to hear your tips on how to manage that because that's a whole lot of plants. But before that, we need to know, Cyril. Drum roll. <laughs> how many plants do you have in your unbelievable home in California? Indoor and outdoor because oh I my am God. blessed to have that. <laughs> oh, yes. So, yeah, indoor. I did count a few weeks ago because I think a friend asked. And I usually stop counting my plants. And just like Phoebe, I was only counting the pots. And if they were the same, I would count them as one. Okay. So I think I'm around 200, probably 201 because I have a cutting now mm -hmm. and that's indoor. And probably on this, not even entire room because this is a small room. We just have a cat box, some dressers, and this shelf, all these shelves that I put up mainly for the plants is around 60-ish too. And that tiny shelf that I have on that south facing window, the it was like 65. And you'd be shocked how many small tiny pots you could fit in like a small shelf. Mm, totally. When you or start a like window, counting so. oh one, two, three, and then eventually you're like, oh wow, 60. And this is just like <laughs> four feet by like five or six feet real estate, I guess. And outdoor, yeah, yeah. I think I would have around 100-ish because I'm not counting like arrangements or terrariums. Right. So oh, of course. That's not cheating, right? <laughs> no, no, no. One pot. You can count per yeah. pot for sure. Oh, my God. Yeah, well, I actually have a little outdoor roof garden, but mm. I didn't count it just because like I know they're going to die. I brought some back in, but I didn't. No, yeah, that's uh, fair. Give yourself back. Yeah. Don't worry about that number. Yeah. Yeah. Cyril, with 200 plants, do you have plants in every room or do you have most of your plants in a couple of the rooms indoors? Well, it'll be linked to my tip later, but people will probably be surprised. I don't have a plant in my bedroom like <gasps> a lot of you guys do. And I don't have like a single one. I did have like a fake one sterile leaf even before when I was into plants and because <laughs> I was doing that for like my Instagram photos before. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no plant at all in the bedroom. Other than that, the spare room, the bathroom, the kitchen. Is that a lighting thing or is that a preference? Yes, thing? it is a lighting thing. Okay. Because that bedroom, I don't want to torture any plant. It's really dark. It's so small that I can't even like probably put a shelf in it to Got install it. Okay. grow lights and stuff. So I just, it's just, I guess, convenient. Probably the only place that I don't see a plant. <laughs> That's amazing. Oh my gosh. Well, perfect. So now that we know your numbers, <laughs> I want to know, I've asked you guys to share three tips for organizing your urban jungles. And I'm sure everybody kind of has their own care practices. So Phoebe, why don't we start with you? So my biggest tip is to set yourself a routine. I always recommend setting time out once a week or depending on the season, obviously. So like in the summer, I give myself like definitely once a week. Mm -hmm. And then the winter, kind of like one and a half to two weeks. So take one day or two hours or a few hours off mm -hmm. just to, you know, spend time with your plants, making sure that they're all happy. If they need pruning, do that, check for pests. And also like on top of that, the general like maintenance, like watering, wiping down the leaves. I think for me, I do that because it also kind of translates as self-care. It just takes brings me to like another like world when I'm like tending my plants. I really like zone out. I'm doing my own thing. Sometimes I'm watching TV, but sometimes I'm just really into it. And it just like sets me really well for the week. Another thing is to kind of group plants together. So I tend to try and group like my cacti and succulents together because they need a specific part of the window in my apartment. And then I group more like of the tropical air plants together because they need to be by the humidifier. So grouping these plants, they can also have very similar care, right? So like cactus and succulents, I don't really go towards the corner because as often because they don't need as much 
watering compared to like my tropical plants. So my tropical plants will be closer to me, mm-hmm. like closer reach. Whereas my cacti, they can be like shoved in a little corner by the window. If I don't see it, it's okay because I know they're still going to thrive. Oh, and play around with vertical spaces. You know, like if you have a tall ceiling or even if you don't, like just think vertically. I think even if you have so many plants and I know it gets very overwhelming, like just build vertical spaces, build shelves, which is what I have definitely helps like elevate your space and also kind of allow you to play around with like spacing plants instead of looking like a hot mess. Totally. (laughs) Going up the wall. I mean, you get to a point where you got no more floor space and the only thing you can do is start buying plant stands or I have the same three tiered Ikea plant stand in like every corner of my house. I think I have three of them at this point. Yeah, I love that. And I think for a lot of people, I've heard from a lot of people in the listener community that that grouping plants with similar needs together can be a real game changer, especially if you're someone who wants to take care of ferns, like put all your ferns in the same place so you can check on them every day or every other day. And then like you said, like put your cacti wherever you want (laughs) because you don't have to worry about them as much. Yeah. And then like once you officially, everybody's happy, the plants are happy, you're happy, then treat yourself to another plant. Exactly. And that's, then find another space. Kind of, totally. sometimes. Most of the time. That's I what that. I tell my friends and people. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Lucretia? So biggest tip is to decide how much time do you really have to devote to taking care of your plants? Yeah. Because people are so good for saying, I want to go and buy a plant. I want to go buy my first plant. I'm going to go and buy a fiddle leaf fig. And I'm like, oh, for the love of God, don't do that. Mm-hmm. That is not a plant for a new plant person, but it never fails. People will get excited about the trendy plants that are out right now, the monsteras and the fiddle leaf fig. And then they don't understand that a fiddle leaf fig is a ficus and that ficus don't like you to mess with them. They like to be left the hell alone. And then you also want to put it in a spot that it hates. Yep. So I've had a fiddle leaf. I've had two small fiddle leaf figs. I've had an Altisma, and I've also had a rubber plant, which are all in the ficus family. And when I first got my rubber tree, it was dropping leaves left and right. And I'm like, what is your problem? Until I found where it wanted to be. And it now sits by the south facing window, approximately a foot away from the window. And I leave it the hell alone. And it has been doing perfectly fine for over a year. So I tend to ask people, so they're like, so what are some plants that I should get? I'm like, how much time do you really want to spend with the plants, taking care of the plants? And once you know how much time you want to spend, then you can go and do your research. That's like tip Mm -hmm. number one and two. Mm -hmm. Do some research on the plant. Google is your friend when it comes to plant shopping because you can take a picture of the plant I tell people to use Google Lens to take a picture of the plant so it'll pull it up and you can learn about it. If you've got pets or young kids, you can learn if it's toxic. So decide how much time you want to spend with it. That second tip as a newbie parent or even someone who's seasoned is use Google Lens to tell you what a plant is and learn as much as you can about it because that will also tell you how much time you really want to spend with it. And finally, if you and the plant don't get along. Plant relationships, just like people relationships, they can be seasonal. And sometimes you are just not meant to be together and you need to break up. So <laughs> I love that. People who follow me know that me and the maiden hair fern don't get along. I documented its life and death over a two week period <laughs> and the trauma that it put me through. Oh. oh, it's so dramatically ridiculous, even to the point of it being banished to the backyard to die on its own. <laughs> since it was disrespecting my house and all the (laughs) other plants and everything. But just being able to let go of the plant. If your plant has three leaves left on it, sending me or anyone else pictures of the vine and saying, do you think I can save it? No, it's basically dead. Let it go. And the beauty of that is that you can go and buy a new plant and possibly something that you will get along with better. Hopefully if you've learned anything about it. So I love what Phoebe said about spending that time with your plants. For me, that's Sunday, where I will just spend that time really paying attention. I water them throughout the week because I'm checking or I'll see one of the plants will just get really dramatic and droop. And I'm like, what's wrong with you? And I'm like, let me water you and come back in a couple of hours. But 
that devoted time, I can easily spend a couple of hours just looking through, pruning, splitting things up, putting stuff together, thing, plants that I'm propagating, finally putting them into pots. I give plants as gifts to people all the time, which is one of the best things in the world. That's a bonus tip for you right there. Mm-hmm. You never have to buy any gifts for anybody because you give your beautiful plants that they can't find anywhere. So that's always fun too. Totally. Oh my gosh. And also bonus, if you pop them in a terracotta pot, that's a really affordable, super affordable yes. gift, or you can get a nice pot, but yeah, yeah, I love that. My quarantine project was putting together my plant parent personality test because I totally oh, nice. agree with you that there is not the right starter plant for everyone. There's people right. have different lifestyles and there's the right starter plant for different lifestyles. And yeah. it's about that matchmaking thing. And so that's why I like made that test because I feel like also you get to know like a lot of different personality types of different plant parents. And some people are consultants and travel or used to before the pandemic travel every week and spend no time at home. And so like they've really got limited options of the plants that they can water once a month and and not die versus someone who maybe likes a maiden hair fern. I would be curious if your maiden hair fern, once you threw it in your backyard, might start thriving. You know, those things are like so oh, crazy it did, No, it did not. It, it completely <laughs> crisped up like you would not believe. Okay. But I have a friend who has a fern forest. She's easily got about 20, 30 ferns and they are thriving unlike anything in the world. And she has been encouraging me to give ferns a try again. So I did get a heart-shaped fern that I didn't realize was a fern. Until I yeah. flipped over the tag, I was like, oh, <laughs> damn it, it's a fern. <laughs> and I mentioned it to her and she was like, so here's what you're going to do. So this fern has been alive for over a month, thriving, because it basically sits in a basin of water. Yep. That, so I said, ah, she said, you got to water them from the bottom. They're not top waterers. That's not, but they love humidity. Mm-hmm. So that's the biggest thing too, is that a lot of people don't realize these are tropical plants. The majority of your plants have come from some tropical location. Like Southeast they Asia. They are used to. Yes. <laughs> yes. Southeast Asia, Africa. Where it's nice and humid. A lot mm-hmm. of the plants so that you have have come from extremely humid conditions. And so people also mistake that when you say, oh, you need to increase the humidity, they think that means watering the plant. No, that's misting. I missed. There are times that I will sit over in the spot and I'm like, why am I hot? Because I've created an ecosystem that's easily about five degrees warmer in this part of the house than anywhere else Mm -hmm. because of what I created for these plants. So yes, humidity is critically important, but a lot of people think that that means watering them and it's not the same. Totally. You've got a little microclimate going on. Also probably with all the transpiration from all those plants all close together. Mm -hmm. I did a Fern 101 episode with Lisa from the Houseplant Guru. She loves ferns. She's got so many ferns and she keeps a lot of her ferns close to the kitchen sink because as she's doing her dishes or whatever, like she can always see the ferns. And also I feel like that is also kind of a more humid area of the home. Yeah. You can Um, also put them in the bathrooms too. Totally. Yeah. If you have a window. If you've got a window, if you, if I you can't have wait a window. To have a window in my bathroom. I can't wait. It's on Me my vision board, literally. Too. That is on my list too when I get a house. I is know. that I'm like a bathroom with a window <sighs> so wait. that the plants that need that strong humidity will just thrive in the bathroom. It's so or funny. a skylight. Oh, a oh, skylight. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Don't even get me started oh, on this skylight. There. Or just build your own greenhouse, skylight, bathroom, window situation. Well, actually, I'm fortunate I'm that our that. rental now has a skylight in the bathroom. Oh, That's amazing. I'm so jealous. That sounds amazing. Thank you, thank you, Espoma Organics for sponsoring today's episode. Plant friends, we know I love Espoma Organics. This is no new news to anyone. Espoma Organics is a family-owned and operated company dedicating to making safe indoor and outdoor gardening products for people, pets, and the planet. I've adored these products for a really long time now. So I originally fell in love with the Indoor Houseplant Liquid Fertilizer, which is a liquid fertilizer designed specifically for indoor plants. 
But now I really love the entire line of potting mixes and horticultural sprays that Espoma makes as well. So today, as we're talking about large plant collections, I think it's important to highlight the importance of setting up your plants for success with high-quality, well-draining potting mix. When you've got a lot of plants, you've got to do it right the first time, right? So Espoma has a whole line of potting mixes for every type of plant you could need, from their general potting mix to their cactus mix, their African violet mix, their orchid mix, and they have fabulous seed starting, raised bed, and garden soil mixes for our gardener plant parents as well. Although most of my plants are potted up in simply the standard or Espoma potting mix or the cactus mix, when I want to feel a little mad sciency and have a little more fun, I will take the bag of Espoma mix or the African violet mix or orchid mix and kind of mix and match a bunch of different mixes to a custom little mix that I'll make for a plant. It's just a fun little thing that I do on the side these days. But the standard potting mix is also awesome. Speaking of managing a large plant collection, when you've got a lot of plants to tend to, it's important to stick to that high-quality potting mix we talked about, but also a liquid fertilizer that makes fertilizing your plants quick and easy is crucial. Fertilizing 75-plus plants with difficult-to-measure and mix fertilizing products sounds terrible. So with the liquid houseplant fertilizer that Espoma Organics makes, you simply tip the bottle upside down to fill the cap, and then you dump the pre-filled cap into your watering can. It's that simple. It makes it so foolproof, and I'm so thankful for this product. So plant friends, if you're looking for high-quality, organic, eco-friendly products for your plants, Espoma has you covered. To learn more about their organic products for indoor and outdoor plant people, visit espoma.com to see where your local Espoma dealers are, or click the link in the show notes to go to the Bloom and Grow Espoma Amazon storefront to see my favorite picks. Okay, back to our fabulously planty panel. Okay, so Cyril, what are your tips? Well, it's mostly connected with knowing your parenting style. So this is connected with your plant personality test. And I think I need to take that because definitely it would always tell me that I'm someone who likes to overwater. Yeah. So when I found out that, oh, I like to overwater, that's where it started that you get strategic with how you want to deal with the plant care. Like, oh, I tend to overwater. I like tropical plants. Which plants do thrive with that kind of parenting style? I like succulents. I love cacti. But since I overwater, but also the fact that I live in California, I could like happily exile them outside so they could escape my overwatering indoors. So that's one of the few things that I learned about myself in the first few months that I got into plants. So knowing if you're someone who likes to overwater, or you're someone who's so busy and only has the weekend to just give that time to yourself and do your plant care and self-care during the weekend. So it will really definitely help you address the overall plant care and your, I guess, strategy in dealing with a large plant collection. And then next would probably be also strategically assign your plant corners. So when you asked me earlier where I had plants in, so I had plants in this spare bedroom where I keep most of my tropical plants because this side was the one facing the beach or the sea. It's colder than the rest of the house. And during winter, it is way colder for sure. But this is where I could keep a humidifier. It's a smaller room. So it does keep the humidity Mm -hmm. up during the summer or spring and even better during fall and winter. So I strategically placed all the plants that thrive in that kind of climate here. And of course, as you guys probably have seen, all the cacti and succulents are just outside. I let Mother Nature take care of them for me. I just stop myself from watering them. And in the living room, getting creative with unconventional spaces. Like I knew I only had that one sliding door, which is east facing, I think. It's not even a strong light, but I did have that high ceiling and all those empty kitchen cabinets that I don't really use. So that's where I planted all, well, not really planted, but all my philodendrons that I put in moss poles and they could happily grow up without me overwatering them. So that's also strategic. People often wonder like how I get up and I always say like, you have to basically climb the counters. But for someone- So so you get some (laughs) exercise too. Yeah, and for someone who's obsessively watering plants, that's their saving grace that I can't access them all the time. And there's some skylights on this side. So it's really a very convenient place for them to be in and a good use of space. I occupied this space, filled it with something that I love, kept them away from my overwatering. So it's a win-win situation. I love that. Yeah. And I guess the last tip 
I could suggest is take note of the plants that tend to thrive under your care and in your growing conditions. So when I was a newbie, of course, almost three years ago, I was so in love with calatheas and prayer plants. Mm. And I initially, I, well, I thought that I would do well with them because I tend to overwater, but I'm not a consistent overwatering person. That's the problem. Oh my God, <laughs> me course, too. That's a perfect way to put it. Right? Sometimes you would end up watering them twice a week and then the next week you, they would really enjoy a good drying in between. And that's how I killed most of my prayer plants. Right now, I only have a few <laughs> strong survivors inside terrariums or glass potches. And that's the only way I can keep them happy. And I also learned that our water is not that um, soft, I guess. Not as good as New York. Mm. So <laughs> ours, I mean, I water my prayer plants purely with like distilled or purified water because the tap water is just so oh, bad. Oh, you do? Them. Yeah. So do you buy separate water or you have a filter that you use? I only have a few, so I don't really have to stock a lot. And they're always in a closed environment anyway. So this is probably like a sin and people will probably call me out for it. But the extra purified water, if I give some to my cats, the extra ones, I put them in a container and that's what I use for my pear plants. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're divas, but not treated that diva yet, I guess. (laughs) I love it. I don't see anything wrong with that. When I had plants that were having some issues, I did do distilled water to just see if that's Mm -hmm. what it was. But now I let my water sit overnight. So I have a couple of containers. Like I keep one down here by the plant. So if something needs water, it's water that's been sitting for days. Mm -hmm. And then I have another container filled with water to do the same thing because I do think that we just can't predict what's in the water anymore. Honestly, it's not just the water being hard. I mean, it's the drugs. If you think about what people are consuming and Mm -hmm. how things are being cleaned and not being cleaned. I mean, it's amazing that our plants aren't all dead. Yeah. I mean, I also heard rainwater is the best water. Mm -hmm. That's what the actual plants of their natural habitat actually get. Mm -hmm. So I know actually a a couple of people who actually who have a fire escape, they like would put a little bucket outside and just like collect Mm -hmm. water. Mm -hmm. I tried doing that a couple of times with like my little like flower vases, my old apartment, but the vases got stolen. So never did that again. (laughs) I mean, you gotta love New York. You (laughs) gotta love New York that someone would steal your vases off your fire escape. I was so excited. It was like pouring torrential rain in New York. I'm like, I'm going to do this because I keep forgetting. I did it and I come back. I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to collect so much water now. And I go up and I'm like, wait, where are my bosses? (laughs) That's crazy. Rudy Bloom, he lives in Denver and he has a whole contraption that captures the gutter water. And I guess he lives in Colorado and there are certain rules for how much gutter water you can collect, but he like has a barrel that like gets filled and waters Mm -hmm. his plants that way. And I was like, that's next level. One day. One day. Oh, I'm going to do home. that when I get a house too. That's yes. super smart. Totally. It's super smart. I mean, I look at gutters where the water is just draining off and I'm like, man, all that water. It's free. Right there. That's resource free. that you're not using. Yep. Totally. Yes. So I am totally capturing. But like Phoebe said, I forget sometimes when it's raining. It's like, oh, I can't capture oh, all that rain. All the so. time. Yeah, it's just All so rare here that it barely rains. So I guess that's a my right, problem. Right, California. A very, you're <laughs> in a very different situation. Mm-hmm. That's true. So I wanted to ask you guys your best design tip for making sure that it doesn't look cluttered. Because I think when you collect a lot of plants, it can feel cluttered. And that's for me when I had to go on my plant pause when like it was just too much. So do you have any suggestions? I know Phoebe had mentioned go vertical. I think that's definitely like the best hack ever. Yeah. Like shelves are your best friends. I also hang my plants with a, like a curtain rod. Yeah, totally. Obviously it has to be with the right screws and voltage, but I love just hanging plants and, you know, it creates like this really beautiful green curtain moment in your Mm -hmm. apartment and it might even save you money from buying real curtains if you are okay with that. And it would also give you privacy. And from the outside, people probably think your apartment's like fabulous inside. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Great. I love that. What about you, Lucretia? I like to group 
plants together. So I like my snake plants, which are sitting by the TV. I wanted to add some greenery to that area because the way that the light comes in through the south facing window, there's a love seat that kind of blocks some of that light, but it still gets light because the plants are still growing. But I like to group them together. To me, it just looks better sometimes instead of having that single plant. And it kind of looks a little more organized, especially if it's one type of plant. So the snake plants and like I'm looking at some philodendrons that are together. So that kind of looks interesting together. And then there's my bird of paradise is kind of sticking up out of the middle of it along with the birkin, which gives a little bit of height, but it still seems a little more organized. So I found that I'm less interested in buying every type of popular plant because I'm more interested in how do the plants look together now. And yeah, yeah, I just like how that looks better. Or I have like a shelf that has the little cubicle squares and I'll put plants in those. And I kind of like how that looks too, especially the ones that are trailing. That's a nice little area to give them some room to trail, but also to make it look a little more organized too. Yeah, I want to add to that. So like having all these plant shelves, I always say like, don't just put plants because it looks cute. Like I think definitely like for my plant shelf, I can spend two to five hours just organizing my plant shelf because it's kind of like yes. math or science, whichever one you want science, to call it. It's, sure. You really have it to is. think about the care. So like I usually put the plants that I can quote unquote neglect a little bit on the taller shelf. Mm -hmm. And, but then it's like, oh, does it have to be closer to the window? Does it need more light versus less light? And then on top of that, I love design. So I always like to play with like textures and patterns and Mm. colors and shapes. So it's kind of like process of elimination every time I'm like stacking where the plant goes and how it, where it sits, why it's sitting next to this plant and why it's trailing down like this versus a straight plan. I love kind of figuring it out. It's like a little problem solving, like puzzle for Mm -hmm. me to be like, okay, where do you go? And like recently when I was reorganizing, I noticed that one of my Hoyas, which I've had for three years, I got as a little tiny cutting. And now I'm like, oh my God, you've graduated to like the third tier. I don't even have to think about you now. You're doing so fine. So it's like, it's all the (laughs) way up in my like fourth, fourth floor. The fourth floor. (laughs) Moving on up. The penthouse. The penthouse. It's a big deal with the Hoyas Mm -hmm. because they just grow so slow. Mm -hmm. And when you see something, you're like, ah! Are those new leaves? (laughs) What is that? Is that a new? What's going on with this? And then once your plants are thriving... It's like, you're like, oh, you're good. I don't even Mm -hmm. have to take care of you much. Like, you're good. Yeah. Totally. What about you, Cyril? Yeah, I think that you should know what aesthetic you like, because that's important on deciding on what's your unifying theme. For example, one of my Shelfie, I do like the warmer kind of tone. So I go for terracotta, all those Aztec prints, like patterns. So you can mix and match those. Plus, you can decide on the combination of the plant as well. And then the height, you could mix and match them to create different levels and depth. And that is what makes it interesting. And you could also like change it up according to season. So at times, well, there was a point that I wanted all white pots and they were ceramic and you would keeping them uniform, but also different and not too matchy matchy, I guess that's the right term. Makes it interesting. Even that's why I always get surprised. Like, oh, there's already 60 because it doesn't look that much cluttered Mm -hmm. when you took your time to arrange them. And based on the care, you're also your preference and the aesthetic. So that's really important. And how all those very beautiful shelfies that go viral, they're always like following a specific theme or doing a particular aesthetic. And that's what makes it successful. Although I'm always a maximalist, I just can't do it just one or two and a little cute here and there. Phoebe is also raising her head. Yes, right I am now. definitely a maximalist. So I know how it's not for everyone, but you could make it more appealing to a larger audience, I guess. When you have a unifying factor, it can be the color. It can be like the style. If you want to do all trailing plants, then let all the trailing plants trail in front of your shelf mix and match the small ones with the large plants. And I think that's a really successful combination to make it not look cluttered. I wanted to touch on what he said about the pot Mm -hmm. colors. And I realized that I was picking certain colors of pots. And so what I've decided to do is that I have mostly white pots or they're gray. And then my colors, my pops of colors are blues and yellows. 
And then there are some terracotta pots. But something else that a lot of people, the first thing that many people do is that they'll get their new plant, bring it home, and they immediately repot it. Do not do that. <laughs> Let it acclimate to your home. Leave it in that nursery pot. There's a reason why your plants are thriving at the nursery. And then you bring them into your ecosystem, which may suck. And the plant is shocked. It just has no idea what's going on. So if you decide on like a color palette, you can just buy pots and just put that plant in mm -hmm. that pot, whatever it is. But having that unifying color really does help if you're trying to go for an aesthetic look, especially in a space that you know that you're going to have people come in. You want to show it off. That really does help your space not look so cluttered and it's just messy, unless that's your thing. That was the biggest change for me when I was growing my collection was figuring out that I had to unify my pots and not my plants. And I, because I'm cheap, I'm based in terracotta and then some white. I'm mostly terracotta. I have some pops of white. And then I have a couple of like a couple of blush tones, but I stay in that like terracotta white mm. blush brown palette. And I love it. And I have a couple of pops of gold and bronze, but it's like in the beginning of my plant parrot, I had like big blue and white pots and like green and like just all this weird stuff. And it, the pots didn't go together. So it didn't matter what the plants looked like because the pots just weren't cohesive. And I think sometimes people get so obsessed with the plant, they don't necessarily think about that. Yeah. And also mm -hmm. kind of seeing if you're bringing more plants in, I mean, more pots in, seeing what you have in your space already, look at the color palette that you already have. and Right, that you that. naturally gravitate yeah, to. Like, yeah, like for example, like I have so much terracotta and if I just like randomly put like a black pot or a gray pot there, people are going to be like, what is she thinking? Yeah. Why is it there? <laughs> for example, like the Raven ZZ, it's a darker color plant. And for me, it's actually not in my collection. It's actually my partner's office and he's got this like, black, gray, white theme vibe in his office. So I paired it with like a matte black ceramic pot. Mm -hmm. And like, it just looks nice. so cool, like so slick. Yeah. It's easy to care. So just kind of like playing around with it. And like, for example, like I actually have a pink corner and I love colors in general, but I love also grouping colors together if I can. Cool. You know, plants in the majority of them are green, but I just start collecting pink plants and I was like, oh, you all kind of look cute together. So I have like a little pink corner in my jungle home. Hashtag on Wednesdays, we plant pink. Yes. yes. <laughs> and um. I just wanted to add that even if you already have existing colors, because what I did with mine, like when you buy something from the grocery store, it's in a bright red pot. Spray paint does a lot of magic. Oh, yes. If it doesn't yes. meet your oh, aesthetic, yeah. Yeah, yeah. spray paint that white, spray paint a terracotta and you save it yourself. Tip bucks mm -hmm. you also save the pot from being thrown out i mean good if you could give it yes. to someone who loves that aesthetic but it's a really cheap hack or do a pot swap plant yeah pot that swap. works too yes. pot swap instead of a plant swap oh my god i love that or i mean if you want to swap a plant you can do that too swap a pot with a plant i think i remember like back in the day i traded like a string of pearls with like a really cool like tribal looking like terracotta pot and i was like sold that's awesome mm -hmm. There's so many different varieties. I mean, we can move on. We're talking about pots for so long, but also the thing with terracotta, I'm not like everyone can choose whatever they want, but the thing with terracotta is there's so many different cool types of terracotta and like all these pots with faces on them and like different styles. Like, I don't know. I feel like people do such cool stuff with terracotta and normally they always have a hole, a drainage hole, yeah. which is yes. a big thing for me yes. too. So. Mm -hmm. And I think they're on the cheaper side too. Yeah, um, they are. They're easier to find and they're also very porous, like yeah. the materials. So it just like overall, I think this is great with plants. And I personally think the color pairs really well with green. Totally. <laughs> That's true. It does. Totally. It does. Yeah. And a tip about terracotta pots is that if you have a plant that is very moisture loving, it loves water terracotta will suck the water out of your soil. So what I like to do with terracotta pots is I like to soak them so that they already have water oh, cool. in them yeah. oh, and then okay. put your plant in there. But the cool thing about terracotta also is that if it's wet, it's cold. So you can learn real quick that if your plant needs to be watered, if it's not already drooping because the pot has soaked all the water out of it, touch it. If it's not cold to the touch, then your plant is probably really 
dry and needs to be watered. I feel like this episode, the title is like how to manage an indoor large plant collection, but I feel like it could also just be called like Plant Parenthood 101. Like these tips are (laughs) so good. (laughs) It all basically goes back to Plant Parenthood 101. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Once you master Plant Parenthood, I just think about graduation. You just got to graduate to the next level of Plant Parenthood. I think like every 20 to 50 plants you get, you've graduated. Yeah. <laughs> so that is so true. Yeah. And then also true. if you get rid of plants, you also graduate. If yes, you have the savvy to then maybe get rid of some plants, then you mm-hmm. graduate another level and then mm-hmm. you bring some more plants that are better suited. Yeah. The more advanced plants. Exactly. I love that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's a big deal too, because I was also tortured by a white fusion, which is a calathea, <laughs> and, but it was beautiful. Oh, it was so you see that plant and you're like, it looks fake. It looks like yeah. it's completely painted. Yeah, it's it looks beautiful. fake. And brought it home, didn't realize that it needed the level of moisture that it did. And I've got two prayer plants and then I actually have three. And the third one wasn't going to get it. I was like, no, let me keep the two I have alive because someone was like, oh yeah, those are calatheas. Like, I don't have calatheas in my collection. He said, those are calatheas. I'm like, I don't have calatheas in my collection. He said, a prayer plant is a calathea. And I saw someone who had one that's variegated. I've never seen it before. And I was like, I got to have that plant. I just got to have it. But what I've learned is because I learned from the white fusion what it needed. These plants are misted when I get up in the morning and a couple of times during the day. So the humidity is just really high and the plants are also grouped together so that they can maintain the humidity that you need. They're but like when you learn they're cuddling. They do. They do. And yeah. when you learn what works for you, that's what you stick with. And there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. So don't let anybody shame you into well, why do you have a house full of snake plants? No lie, I would love to have a room that's just snake plants because there are so many different varieties of that one sans vera plant. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. Talk about a collector's dream. Mm -hmm. So good. I feel like if I had my own private outdoor garden, I would probably start collecting cacti. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. No, I want cacti. If I had the so conditions, bad. I would be all over oh my cacti. God. I'm kind of glad I don't have that yeah. condition, like that in that spot because I think it won't be 143. <laughs> yeah, 100%. Oh, no. It's another black oh, no. hole. Not with all of plant. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah, exactly. exactly. I mean, I saw a beautiful barrel cactus and I just stood in the nursery with it and they were like, do you have any questions? I said, no, I just want to hold it because I can't take it home with me. I they were like, well, why not? I said, plants. this needs perfect conditions to thrive. I don't have those, but I will just go and just sit and look at that cactus. Looking from up top. Gorgeous. The perfect, how the ridges are spaced so perfectly. It's mesmerizing perfect. to look at. It's amazing. And I just think that when you're matured and that's plant parenting maturity, when you know that you're yes. beautiful, but if I can't have you, I can admire you from afar instead of torturing That's the right. plant and myself of to another loss, I guess, in the next few right. weeks or months. And that takes a lot of courage, too. And that's a really beautiful approach to free show. Thank you I so love that. much. That's so beautiful. I feel so seen right now. I'm like so obsessed with this conversation. You're all like my soulmates, I feel like. But, um, <laughs> and Cyril, that's the perfect segue because I want to get real with you guys right now and share something that I went through when I was like beginning my plant collection. And I know that so many listeners in this community have reached out and talked to me about it. And I know it's something we all struggle with. So I went from zero to 60, like a crazy, I like went crazy. Something switched in my like very addictive prone brain when I started collecting plants. And I think in three months in like 500 square feet, I had 60 plants no organization. They were like everywhere and it was starting to feel unhealthy. And I wasn't really able to care for them correctly because also my knowledge hadn't like met up with me yet. So I was still like kind of unsure what types of plants I had. I was still Googling. A lot of them weren't happy. And so my boyfriend, my now fiance put me on a plant pause and it's like the best thing that ever happened. I'm so thankful that he was living with me at that time because I think if I hadn't had him to kind of hold the mirror up to me, I think I would have just kept doing this. And I think I would have ultimately probably ended up killing all the plants because it was just a really unhealthy state. And then also plant care started getting stressful and not Mm. joyful. And that's why I'm here with for plants. That's why I'm 
making this podcast to like bring joy mm-hmm. to people with plants. I think you shouldn't be too harsh on yourself when you mm-hmm. kill a plant. Like people totally. assume that I don't kill plants. And I'm Same like, no, man. we all do. Yeah. Everybody, if you don't kill plants, you are not a true person who loves plants. <laughs> You're not trying hard enough. Period. Yeah, you haven't tried <laughs> at all. Yeah. I you think, haven't tried. Exactly. I think it's also, you know, if you kill it, you can be sad about it. But then it's also like any life mistake. If you make a mistake, you can try again. And if you try again, you've learned from that mistake. Yeah. You're going to yeah. do so much better. I've had mistakes with certain plants like Calatheas. I finally got one of my Calatheas to actually thrive. It was suffering with like mealybugs. Like I'm a rescue plant mom. I love rescuing plants, even though they're like on the dying breath with the three leaves. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, I'll I, take it. <laughs> yeah, literally, I love rescuing plants if I can. And I just love, again, like problem solving and like, oh no, I want that challenge to like revive you back. And like my Monstera, you know, that was a rescue plant many, many years, like three years ago. And now it's six foot tall. And I got it as like a three mm. leaf, like small little, like dying, like, ooh, wilting leaf cutting. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. There are some plants that you can bring back, but like you said, you have to let go of that guilt of a plant dying. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I've easily killed good 10, 15 plants easily. Yeah. And it's just been learning what works for you, what doesn't work for you. That's how I learned that there are certain ferns that I can keep alive, like a bird's nest fern. Didn't realize that people usually kill it because they water it wrong. They water in the middle. And you don't water that plant from the middle because that's where it'll rot. But it's things like that that you have to do things to learn. What do you do with the plant? What don't you do with the plant? Most people honestly kill their plants by overwatering. They drown them to death. And it's, it's just they're like they over love it or they touch it all the time or they're moving it or they're in every damn picture on Instagram. And I'm like, that's why your ficus is die because you don't just leave it alone. And a lot of plants, they don't really like us. If you think about where do they grow, most monsters are growing under trees, attached to trees. Yep. That's where they grow. And where do we put them? Out in the sun and then wonder why, why is my plant burnt? Why does it look like that? Because it's growing in a forest under big trees and everything. That's what it's doing. And you're putting it in conditions it's just not used to. So really do the research on those plants to really learn what does it have? What do you need? And also just learn what your families of plants are that you love. For me, that's philodendrons, pothos, ZZ plants, snake plants. And then I love Hoyas because there's so many different types of Hoyas. I'll see some, I'm like, what is that? Like it's a Hoya. I'm like, is it? I just got my first flower bloom this week. Oh, yeah, you got to check out her Instagram Wait. reel. It's unreal. Oh my goodness. I did like a little watch party. Every day I was like, I was checking up on it and it just didn't bloom. And I was like, is it now? Is it now? And then finally it like bloomed and I luckily caught it on a time lapse. So I have this like beautiful that video. It's amazing. Yeah. yeah. So I'm also learning. So also like I have so many plants, but I'm learning all about new Hoyas and how they bloom, how long they take. And like they have different personalities compared to other like tropical plants too. So it's like, it's also a learning process. Totally. Yeah, I was telling a friend that I had done some basic research on this one particular snake plant that I had. And I was like, oh, it blooms? So I mentioned that. And it's always interesting, too, when writing captions to see if people actually read some of your long captions. And (laughs) someone read it. So I, I like to find little fun facts or tips to put in there. And someone said, this plant blooms? And someone else was like, it does. And they actually had a picture of their snake plant with a bloom coming up. And I was like, I've never seen that before. So that was amazing when you can learn what those perfect conditions are to get that plant to Mm -hmm. bloom. Because we have a lot of plants that bloom that we just don't even know about. Yeah, like Pileas. I didn't know Pileas bloomed. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And like the way they bloom. Isn't that crazy? It's like a little firecracker situation. And I was like, wow. I did not know that until I put it outside, like on my roof. And I was like, what is this cool little thing that's happening right here? And I was like, oh my God, it's a flower. (laughs) I think that's a good perspective, though, that Lucretia had brought up is that really Monsteras, yes, but like really any plant we're bringing indoors is not supposed to be indoors. They live in the tropical jungle. So I think like to give yourself a little grace and also like not take yourself too seriously because 
we're all just like trying to keep these tropical alien babies. They're not <laughs> supposed to have heating. They're not supposed to have central air. And we're just doing our best Say to try that. and replicate their environments and love them the way we can. And I think like not taking it too seriously. And also it's really refreshing to hear you all who have these beautifully curated Instagram feeds that look perfect and look all of these things. It's really nice to hear that you still struggle and still kill plants and you're still learning. Mm -hmm. I think that's important for everyone to understand. And to share that with people too, to let people know that everything that you see on Instagram is curated, period. Mm -hmm. But what I find is that the people who follow me in my community like that I tell the truth about y'all, but like me and the Palea, people love that plant. I'm looking at one that's I'm going to take to a plant swap this weekend that I'm hosting because we just are not meant to be. It's healthy. I've even tried to let it die and it just will not die and it keeps popping out <laughs> babies, but I just don't love this plant. Somebody's going to love this. So it's, it's like going to a garage sale. Somebody's trash is somebody's treasure. Mm-hmm. Not that I think any of my plants are trash, but they're healthy, but we just don't get totally. I just don't love it. I don't love this plant. And that's okay. Exactly. That's okay. Okay. Exactly. Cyril, do you have anything you want to say to any plant parent out there feeling a little overwhelmed right now? Well, one, it is a journey. You will learn a lot in the process. Don't be ashamed. I think we've stressed it enough. Don't be ashamed. You could refer to how others were successful in their own journeys, but it doesn't mean that what works for them would also work for you. You would really only find out once you go on that journey by yourself as well. Yeah, And it's individualized. It's something that's subjective. So when people always reach out like, hey, how do you manage to do this and that? I would be like, okay, where do we begin? Like, do we talk about (laughs) growing conditions, the plant type? It's like, a very broad topic. You have like an hour or two to sit down and discuss this. But the bottom line is your growing conditions, mine are different. Even if we get the same plant at the same time at a same plant shop, I guess, each specimen will be different and your attack or your strategy would also be different. So that's, I guess you just do it one plant at a time or like maybe 10 every week, like how most of us were at the beginning of our plant journey. It's overwhelming. Like, I just want to hoard them because I've seen them everywhere on Instagram. Mm -hmm. I've seen this plant influencer have this. It's so beautiful. I want this too. But we always like forget the fact that, oh, where does this person live? How are their growing Mm -hmm. conditions? Like, although most of us, as much as we want to showcase our plants, like how our kids would be dolled up for a graduation photo. That's how we do them on Instagram. I enjoy styling them. You are so right. Right? But the reality is they won't always look like that. They would also look raggedy. It depends on the season. Sometimes you have to dull them up every now and then because they don't always look Instagrammable, unfortunately. And that's okay. I guess this is going to be a that's okay session. Yeah, and that's okay. (laughs) That's just... (laughs) And especially now, as we're getting ready to move into the winter months and many of our plants are getting ready to go dormant. Totally. For me, I told people my goal is not to acquire more plants. It's to keep alive as many of the ones that I have as possible. And that's already starting to prep for the cooler conditions, knowing that the air now is going to go from being air conditioned or now with not having the air conditioner on, but now moving to the heat that's going to now be flowing to keep the house warm. And I've got more plants now that have, I think I've tripled my collection from last year to where it is now. And so it was like, oh yeah, we're not going to buy any more of those because we just want to keep alive what I have. So because I know which plants will do better, the ones that I'm most concerned about are obviously the prayer plants because they're freaking Calatheas. So knowing that they need that humidity, I'm really thinking about a, a humidifier that, which is what I ran in the winter last year, which was just running a cool mist humidifier. And people would come in and be like, what is that? They're like, are you doing that for the plants? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> And look at my skin. Thank you. So mind Thank your business, you. okay? <laughs> look my amazing. skin looks great. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and do the plants. So You're like maybe you might. This is working <laughs> for everybody. <laughs> oh my god, <laughs> that's great. 
I love this. Thank you guys all for being so real with us and these amazing tips. And I think I just want to close this out by saying we all have a different amount of plants that we have. There are some people where three plants is going to be their max and that's where they're comfortable. And there are some people where 300 or Summer Rain Oaks 1000 is where they're comfortable. And none of the numbers actually mean anything. It's always Mm -hmm. fun to talk about, but what really means the most is whatever amount of plants you have, they're making you happy and they're not stressing you out. And if they're stressing you out, just like pause a minute and reassess Mm -hmm. and take all these tips that everybody gave you. And also know, like Lucretia said in the beginning, like it's cool to let go of your plants if you need to. It is. So I'm sure that everybody is going to want to go stock your accounts to check out your collections now that we've heard so much about you guys. So can you please tell us where and all the different medias everybody could find you? So Cyril, can you start first? Yeah, I'm Cyril Cybernated. I have a Facebook page, of course, Instagram. I also recently started YouTube. And yeah, basically that's it. (laughs) Awesome. What about Lucretia? You can find me at Soul Sister Plants on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, and uh, might eventually move to YouTube at some point. I'm on over. The water's fine. Oh, yeah. Also, Lucretia has a very funny Instagram TV show called How to Play! (laughs) (laughs) Hell Plants! Hell Plants! Yeah, I do it every Wednesday, and I talk to people. The tagline is I talk to people who have hella plants about hella plants, but you never know where the conversation is going to go. I don't send questions. It's completely unscripted except for the poem that I read at the beginning. I love it. And it, it's just a fun way for me to have, I tell people it's an hour out of the week to just have fun and let people laugh and come in and just be silly. So it's a fun little thing to do. Great way to connect with the community too. Totally. Got to go check it out. And what about you, Miss Phoebe? So you guys can find me at Welcome to the Jungle Home, starring my cat, Pixel, who is literally the king of the jungle. The and true star. The, the true, true star. star. Yeah. Not even my plants or myself, just him. Mm-hmm. You can catch him every Catterday <laughs> for his little <laughs> cameo. And also, you can also find me on Facebook. Again, Welcome to the Jungle Home. And also, I now have a website with my shop where I sell my plant tarps. So, your plant tarps. Yes, yes your yeah. plant tarps. That so you- if you guys ever need a gardening product where you won't make much mess, definitely grab one. Yeah, it's a tarp. It like it rolls up and snaps and you can do your indoor repotting and not get soil all over your mm-hmm. floor. And they come in different colors. Yeah, you can get a whole rainbow of tarps. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so fun. Well, you guys are awesome. Thank you so much for spending all this time with us and sharing your knowledge. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thank you. you. This was great. This was so fun. (laughs) Agree. Oh my gosh. Thank you, Cyril, Lucretia, and Phoebe for this amazing conversation. When this conversation was over, I had like a goony smile on my face for the rest of my night. They were so fun. And We recorded the video of this Skype conversation, so you guys can head over to the YouTube channel and check out little snippets of it if you're interested in seeing the planty setups that we did this interview with because they're all so beautiful. And make sure to go check their Instagrams out and give them a follow because they are definitely plant parent goals. I really admire all of their beautiful collections, and I love that each and every one of them are beautiful examples of how to have a large collection the right way with a healthy mindset. So we're hosting that really fun giveaway I mentioned on Instagram with cuttings from all of our plant collections, including my cutting of Raffi, my Raffidophora tetrasperma for one lucky listener. So head over to Bloom and Grow Radio on Instagram to enter. Thank you again to our amazing Patreon plant friends. I appreciate this community of listeners that's helping me bloom and grow the show across the world. And thank you to our fabulous episode sponsors. Plant friends, it's gifting season, so please try and support the Bloom and Grow Radio sponsors in your gifting season. COVID has hit everyone hard, and everyone has been so resilient, so let's help our sponsors out. Plus, they make amazing products. So, speaking of amazing products, thank you Modern Sprout for 15% off their grow lights, herb, flower, or plant grow kits, and a ton of amazing planty accessories. Use code 15BLOOM at checkout for 15% off at modernsprout.com. And also to learn more about Espoma Organic's amazing organic products for indoor and outdoor plant people, visit espoma.com to see where your local Espoma dealers are, or click the link in the show notes to check out my Espoma Amazon storefront.
Now that we've thanked everybody, I just want to talk a little bit more about my experience with my personal plant collection and how that number has fluctuated and what I've let it mean to me, because I do think this is kind of a hot topic in the plant community right now. So personally, my plant collection has fluctuated a lot over my three to four years of plant parenthood. It obviously started out with less than 10 plants, then it went to 60, then I went on a plant pause because... I realized that I was starting to get really overwhelmed with plants, which we talked about. I highly suggest listening to Your Brain on Plants, the episode that I did way back when with a neuroscientist who helped me kind of understand the addictive behaviors that were going on in my brain at that time. Then the collection grew to 120. Then I think it maxed out at 130. And you know, I really loved having 130 house plants in our old apartment. I loved the jungle feel that our apartment had, and I do feel like it was a healthy number for me. Since then, since we moved, I gave a lot of plants away, and now we're at around 64 plants, and I have to say, I love having 64 plants, which is half of what we used to have. And you know, when we were moving and when I was giving away some of these plants, it was a really interesting exercise because I felt really attached to the number of plants that I had. And I feel like my plant parenthood had to mean having an epic 100 plus plant collection and reducing the size felt like I was failing as a plant parent or something. But plant friends, I really have to tell you, I'm still getting so much joy from my 60 plants and 60 is still a lot and too many for a lot of people. I could see myself reducing the number even more or adding to it in the future. But the exercise of reducing and adding and reducing, I now feel like I have more freedom around my plant collection. And I'm really trying to approach this collection with the idea of quality, not quantity. I highly suggest everybody approaching their plant collections that way, knowing that we will have moments in life when we want homes filled with lots of lush, happy plants, and we're going to have the time and energy to take care of them. And then we're going to have seasons like the one I'm in right now, where we're like a little bit transient, a little bit homeless. (laughs) We left our apartment. We're not in our new home yet. And it was time to let go of plants. And that's okay. And it doesn't mean anything. But in both of those seasons of life, you can still get joy from plants as long as you keep your collection at that right number so that it's not overwhelming. And if that number needs to change throughout the course of your life, that is okay. That is life, plant friends. So long story short, just you do you, plant friends. That's all I'm trying to say. If you want 300 plants, have 300 plants and nail it. And I hope you love that lush jungle vibe. If you have three plants, take beautiful care of those three plants and nurture them and enjoy that experience too. There's no right way to be a plant parent. And my job as this podcast host and this community leader or community cultivator is just to help everyone understand that we're all blooming and growing in our own way. We should all do what makes us feel good. We should all do what brings us joy, especially in times like these, which can be not so joyful. I'm just here to help everyone bloom and grow. And I love you all so very much. So until next time, my sweet plant friends, keep blooming and keep growing. Plant friends, thank you so much for tuning in today. If you like what you heard, make sure you are subscribed to the show so you never miss an episode. And while you're making sure you're subscribed, why don't you head on over to the review section of whatever podcast player you're tuning into and leave us a review. I would greatly appreciate it. If you are interested in more fun and educational planty content, well, plant friend, I've got a whole lot for you. Subscribe to the Bloom and Grow YouTube show, which is my YouTube channel where I I bring you along for my personal plant journey, as well as share informational content that pairs with our podcast episodes. Follow me at Bloom and Grow Radio on Instagram for behind the scenes, sneak peeks at upcoming episodes, my daily planty lessons and thoughts, and most importantly, tune into my Instagram stories where I am constantly talking with you listeners and plant friends and polling you for content ideas, and I'm always interested in seeing what you're loving these days on Instagram. Join the Bloom and Grow mailing list and get a free download of the Molly Mansfield Keep Blooming print that she created exclusively for our community. And if you can, support Bloom and Grow Radio by becoming a plant friend on Patreon. For as little as $4 a month, you not only help me bring these planty and informative episodes to thousands of ears around the world, but you will also get the super secret planty password to our exclusive Bloom and Grow Radio Garden Club Facebook group, which is a wonderfully active group of plant friends of the Bloom and Grow Radio podcast who make up what I like to call the plantiest corner of the internet. It is a lot of fun over there. 
And as always, my sweet plant friends, I am here for you. If you have ideas for episode topics, guests, or if you're possibly a business interested in sponsoring the show, reach out to me because I am here to help all of you keep blooming and keep growing. 